Welcome to Comic Book Theater with your hosts, J.R. and the War Dog. What is up? This is the War Dog. Welcome to another episode of Comic Book Theater with my main man, J.R. What's going on, J.R.? What's up, War Dog? Everything's going great so far. Today we have a really great guest. He's the author of the Key Collectors app. And if you don't know about this app, it's amazing. I'm not going to spoil it. He can tell you a little bit more about this. But we have Nick Colonies. What is going on, Nick Colonies? Hey, how are you? It's good to be on. I appreciate you having me on. And I'm uh, with some excited to talk comics. So let's do it. All right, all right. So, John, why don't you why don't you tell us a little bit about what we're going to talk about today? I'll turn it over to you, brother. Thanks, War Dog. Yeah, man. Um, so, this is the way I look at it with something like what Nick does for us in the comic book community. When I was just a young pup out searching for comic books in long boxes, in flea markets, and at garage sales and those type of things. I'm going to give away a bit of my age here. You know, you used to get the the price guides and stuff like that, and then you'd write your list of what you were looking for, and you'd fold it up and you'd put it in your pocket. Or if you were really, really hardcore, you'd have your spiral notebook and you'd be jotting down your notes or whatever. And so in today's day and age, an app like Key Collectors is revolutionary because all of these people who are used to the old school way of doing things, of having your want list on paper, a hard copy, that kind of thing. You actually have it on your smartphone these days. Or if you're on a laptop, you can look it up on the website, those kind of things. But it makes things so much easier. It's it's revolutionizing the way that guys like me go out and hunt back issues or even current issues. So it's a real honor to have you on today, Nick. And we really want to talk to you about the work that goes into an app like Key Collector. And then where you may be, you know, if if you want to throw a few spoilers in there for later, where you see the app going in the future as well. So let, let's start at the beginning, man. What, what gave you the idea to come up with something like Key Collector? Well, you know, I was in the... Uh basement of a warehouse, which, you know, typically these stories don't really end well, but this one, you know, I think it's going pretty good. Mm -hmm. I had a friend, well, he wasn't a friend. I knew somebody that owned a used bookstore. I was going in and he had a lot of comics. And I saw, the first time I walked in, I saw uh, the first uh, X-Men. It was the first appearance of Mr. Sinister. I think it's 221 off the top of my head. And it was a, so I'm like, okay, this guy, you know, he must not know what he has. So I found a bunch of great stuff. And then I was like, do you have any more comics that I could go through? And he said, well, yeah, I have a separate warehouse that has about 50,000 comics because he was a used bookstore. You know, he wasn't a, he dealt in books. So after, I guess, developing this trust and this relationship with the store owner, I said, you know, I said, hey, why don't you let me pull out what is valuable and then you can sell them online and then you build a credit up for me to purchase issues that I want for a discount and with a credit. So we agreed on that. I ended up spending like four or five months in this basement of this warehouse going through comic books. And I thought I knew a lot because I've been collecting since I was nine years old. But it turns out I didn't know as much as I thought I did. And, you know, I was I wanted to do right by this individual. So I was, you know, taking long boxes home and I would uh, Google like all the issues that I didn't know, which was a lot. And then I was like, I wish there was this a resource that just dealt exclusively on what most collectors want, which are the key issues. You know, you have first appearances or, or, or origins or classic storylines or really anything that has value above and beyond that cover price, you know? And usually what I use is I use an $8 minimum, unless it's a first appearance of a character that's been in comics for more than 15 appearances, or if that character has some sort of impact that, 
you know, it deserves to be in the database. So that resource didn't exist. And I started, I thought, well, why don't I make it? And which was, you know, I've never, I've never done anything with tech. The only comic book experience I had was being a collector. So I'm like, oh, I seem like the right guy to be doing this. And yes, I was. I mean, I came in totally unprepared. And, you know, I think just the love for comics has, uh, has, has got me to where it is now. Right. Well, and I can tell definitely from interactions that we've had through, through social media and that type of thing that definitely there's a passion there for comic books with you and with, with the folks that you work with on the development side. Now you, you were saying here about you, you felt like you didn't know enough so you were literally googling everything and i i will I, I will absolutely again admit to that as well as much as i think i know about comic books there's probably 10 times the amount that i don't know and that's why a key collector app like that i don't have to guesswork on it the track record is there as far as testimonials from friends I've seen the books. I've personally dug books out myself that same way. But yeah, just like you said, it really is nearly impossible to be an expert on every type of comic book there is out there. Once in a while, I before Key Collector, I have to admit, I was probably at about a 20 to 30% success rate of having a gut feeling on a book and pulling it and getting home doing my research after the fact and realizing, Hey, I, I was right. But that means, you know, 70, 75% of the time I'm picking up a dollar or $2 book and it's really only worth a dollar or $2. It's just a cool book, which is fine. But like you said, it, a lot of folks really, really want keys because that's what helps. That's what helps you feel like you're accumulating something of value as opposed to only reading which you and i you, i think we all would all agree re reading is the number one enjoyment of collecting comics but it's not the only enjoyment you get from collecting comics right and you know i think that there's two ways to look at it one you know you enjoy the stories but the you know the older we get and the more responsibility that we have the less space you actually have you know if you have a, if you get married and you have kids you just have a lot less space so what i did was and i'm not married and i don't have kids but i you know i don't want to have white boxes everywhere so i sold all of my non-key issues in one lump sum to half price books. I got, you know, I didn't get, I think they paid me like $25 for like hundreds of comics. And I wish that I had collected before then, because I know I gave up some stuff that I should not have given up. But, you know, there's over 12,000 issues in the database that I have hand curated. And, you know, every night, most most nights I'm adding, you know, two to 20 books because I, I find these gems, these oddities that I would never have even, you know, I would have never come across on my own or just by being casual, being a casual collector. And that's the nice thing about key collectors. You can be a casual collector and you can build yourself a great collection because it's, it's all focused exclusively on that stuff. And as far as being a casual collector, there's nothing wrong with just wanting to collect keys. It's like the way that I look at it, it's almost like a museum curator, you know, takes care of these famous paintings or historical paintings. I mean, this is our pop culture history, comic books, and they're finite and they're fragile, and they have something that is unique, like let's say the first appearance of whoever, Dar uh, you know, let's just say Darkhawk. And that is something that is, it is finite. And it could, you know, all of them could at some point be just wiped out. But we as collectors are caring for this stuff. And there is responsibility in that. Absolutely, 100% agree. That That's something that 
we find that the collection, it, it's not, how can I say this? It's not secondary to the reading. I know some people, I get it. If you love to read comic books, read comic books. I know that my to read pile has turned into a to read short box, which is, you know, again, it, it is what it is. I'm not ashamed of that because I, I will get around to reading them at some point, but I, I haven't yet. You know, kind of like you said, you don't want to be living, you don't want to be living in your collection if you can help it. And as opposed to cutting down the overall character count, it's not a bad idea to go that way of, of collecting keys only. I, I think it's, it absolutely serves serves the the greater good like you said treating it like like a museum curator they don't pick up every dead leaf off of every tree they pick up the ones from an exotic tree or an endangered tree or maybe a tree that no longer is with us and they preserve that because that's that's where you see the value because I can go out to my yard and see a maple leaf if I want to. I, it's not a big deal, you know. But like you say, it's something exotic, something different. Definitely, that there. That's a great way to look at it. Todd, you have any questions? Yeah. Uh, well, first off, I totally agree with Nick about the limited space. When I was a kid, I actually quit collecting comic books because my bedroom was filled with long boxes, and I was running out of space. And I was like. What am I going to do with all of these? So I completely agree with you on the, the aspect that you ha- at some point you have to say to yourself, I can only collect so much of something. And I mean, if, if it's going to be anything, it, it should be keys, right? <laughs> you would think so. I mean, you, you know, you look at it like, OK, let's say you pick up 10 books a week. You know, that's, you know, that's, that's 520 books a year. That's two long boxes right there. And then whatever else you want to pick up, you know, there's a lot of these purists who say, oh, I want to, you know, I want to pick up a whole storyline or I want an entire series. But, you know, I mean, look, we have options now. We can go and get digital comics, which say what you will, you know, that's the, it's funny because there's a lot of opinions with collectors in I hear them all, you know, I hear them all like, oh, this is something that is uh, giving too much information to people. And it's like, well, guess what? You know, if people don't have the information and they get discouraged by the hobby, the hobby makes less money and you get less comics until who knows of, I mean, comics are, should be an endangered species as far as new issues coming out because it's an old art form in the sense that there's video games now and there's all these different choices and people are still making a choice to pick up a comic book and read it. That's a great thing. We need to nurture it by giving people education about what are these stories, what's the background, and especially to tap into their nostalgia and allow them to own a piece of, let's say, their childhood. When if they saw the movie Deadpool when they were like 12 and they loved it, you know, and then when they're 25 and they have a full time job and they can actually afford New Mutants 98 and they want to buy it or they want to you know, pick up some other key issues that might have that character in it. You know, I mean, that's that's what we're doing. We're just, you know, we're, we're embracing the new collector, we're embracing the experienced collector, we're embracing the collector that has stepped away for a long time and wants to get back in, but doesn't have the time to get back in like he did when he was younger. Oh, absolutely. Well, and you know, you were talking, you were talking about newer issues kind of being a little more scarce, that kind of thing. That actually is right down the alley of what I was reading yesterday on a cosmic, yeah, cosmic book news. Uh, did you guys see that uh, DC is cutting part of their line? That they're actually they're going to be trimming down the books. It seems like it's going to be about a fifteen percent cut overall on titles. Yeah, on titles. Yeah, on titles. I mean that doesn't count the the variant covers and all of those that they'll be sending out but it sounds like they're going to cut down from like 87 different titles 
to somewhere between 74 and 78, something like that. And I'll tell you, well, I was talking to Todd about this a little earlier. Historically, historically, we've seen where when titles are being canceled, their last few issues become key issues. Oh, yeah. Because because they were short printed, nobody ordered them, that type of thing. Well, then people go back and reread and figure out what great stories they might have been in the middle of whenever they got the cancellation that they had to wrap up. And they do go to, like you say, you know, what for me, for instance, I'm looking to do my best to get from about 150 up through current on Amazing Spider-Man. The the sub 150s, that's going to be pick them up when I can get them one at a time later on. But anyway, having said that, that's a daunting task, especially when there are a few of them in the 400s that were so so short printed because nobody was really buying comic books at all at that point, let alone Spider-Man. They just weren't buying them at hardly at all. Uh, anyway, just out of curiosity, do you see something like that maybe on the horizon with some of these DC books? You know, I think that those, those types of books, when that actually happens, it's, you know, you can't really tell because it's so, so far into the future that it happens. Like, so to your point, you know, Ghost Rider, the second series you know, issue 91 and 90, 90, 91, 92 and 93 are all low print scarce books. And the funny thing is, is that it was it was a part of a storyline that was supposed to end at issue 94. But what happened was they canceled the book and then they ended it at 93. And then 10 years later, that unfinished story was picked up by they they wanted to finish it the writer ivan i think ivan velez and mark uh tex why well, i don't even know how you say his name texira texira they wanted to finish that storyline that was ten, now 10 years it was 10 years old so they released one issue from that series just to wrap that up so but you know punisher there's a bunch of uh late run uh scarce low print issues i mean really a lot of the more popular titles that got canceled they have their two last two or three dark hawk like i mentioned earlier number 50 is m- worth more than number one at this point right at spider-man line when that when during that time like when the first appearance of anti-venom that one's like 89 and it's not that popular of a character but since it was low print run yeah that that's going for Shit, I think the second print is going for like $200 right now. Yeah, that's one of them where, you know, again, stereotypically with the hobby, first prints are what most people will go for if they're if they're serious collectors. But on the flip side, that, that and that's one of the things that I've really enjoyed about the app whenever I'm out hunting for stuff, the specialty buttons that you have there for something like, say, like the Immortal Hulk story, which I know Todd has been since our very, very first podcast. Todd, we, we actually started that with a year in review. And Todd was saying, hey, Immortal Hulk, probably the best series of the year. And I was on board with Donny Cates with Venom. But I mean, definitely the market is bearing out right now that Immortal Hulk is is where it was at from 2018 even into now and maybe the foreseeable future. But even that, like you say, it's it's really, really user-friendly. That's one of the things that I noticed right off the bat with the app was that even in the very beginning, if I needed a character or if I was looking for a title, I could go right to it. And the buttons have changed here and there below, but those are for specialty searches. If you're specifically looking for something, instead of doing the search, you're going directly to, let's say, hearkening back to last week's podcast and Todd talking about Umbrella Academy. Sorry, I still have not watched it. It's on my to-do list. But I've told my daughter I would watch it with her, and that hasn't that hasn't been something where we've been able to schedule that in just yet. Anyway, but you've got an Umbrella Academy button there 
then instead of having to do any other searching, bam, right to it. And it's no shock to me because I've seen it. I've seen it in the app before that, you know, you're even including the free comic book day book and those kind of things that if you're not a seasoned collector, if you are not tuned in to Umbrella Academy right off the bat, you might miss that because how how many how many of us really took care of our free comic book day books? Well, and then there's, you know, the second print, uh, like we were saying, I mean, right now, a couple of hot buttons and comic books, I feel second prints are very collectible and, and getting to be very valuable because people are realizing, especially the ones with alternate covers, that these are low print run issues because they're, they're second prints. So there might only be, let's say, 5,000 or 10,000, and the first print was 50,000 or 75,000. So these alternate cover second prints, which I have an entire category devoted to, and the third prints and the fourth prints and the fifth prints could be worth, you know, like I said, with the anti-venom one, a hell of a lot of money. And there's a ton of different, ca- there's over 200 categories that I've created on the app. And a lot of people don't know that if you tap additional on the app and then tap categories, you will have access to all these categories that, that sort of filter some of this information so that people can more easily find a niche that they might be interested in. Like another emerging trend is these newsprint variant covers where, you know, you have this, where you have the newsprint aspect of a print run and people are really catching on with that as something that is something to hunt for. A lot of this stuff, it's like geocaching. Remember that when people would geocache, go out with a, uh, you know, they'd go out with a GPS and then they'd look for like a, a, button underneath a street lamp or something. It's, it's just something that is difficult to find. And, and that's what some of these uh, more niche type of things are. It's just exciting to look for because it's let, because there's a chance that you might find something that a lot of people aren't going to spot, that a lot of people are overlooking and you might be picking it up out of a dollar bin and it's worth a hundred dollars. My favorite example of that in my own personal life is Superman, uh, Action Comics 869, where Superman is drinking a beer with his father. And I guess there was some controversy about that. And we could get into controversy, but there was controversy about that, that Superman was drinking a beer. It's a bad example. So they recalled that cover and then they re-released it. And it said root beer on the label instead of old crow beer. And I actually found this issue in a dollar bin. And it, right now it's worth $100 raw, ungraded, which is amazing. Gets your heart pumping. When you find something like that, it gets you, you're like, oh, shit. You know, you get excited. It gets your heart pumping. It gets your juices flowing for sure. And I, you know, I have to admit, there are a couple of times that I have found books that were either on the spec deck there or, or the dollar bin. Oh yeah, that's my favorite dollar bin diving. And, and thanks for bringing that up. Yeah, they, so Key Collector's free. It's a free resource. But if you want to, if you want to build more value in your collection, or let's say you want to flip books, or let's say you just want a certain kind of knowledge, you know the the, the categories that are subscribers. It's for a buck ninety nine per month or nineteen ninety nine a year. You open up all the categories, so it's it's a it's a one price catch all. You get hot keys, which is are the keys that are trending. You get the spec deck, which is speculation. Then you get the dollar bin diving, which I love. I love dollar bin diving. Uh, there's there's over three hundred issues in that section, and, and what it is is it's they're modern issues that are often overlooked, but have a considerable amount of value to them. So that's personally my favorite feature. But it, then you also get the key issue alerts, which are which seems to be everybody else's favorite feature, which is their push notifications. So you have to make sure that your key alerts are turned on and you get comic news happening now. So when something is announced in the movie world, it, I mean, it's the craziest thing. 
when I was nine years old, you know, wanting to be, I wish I could draw. I wish I could write comic. I wish I could be in the comic book industry, but I can't draw. My writing is not, you know, pro level. So to be in this position right now is like a dream come true that I never thought that I would actually be, you know, part of this comic book industry. And I have this app that is having an effect on people's collecting that it's becoming it's more enjoyable. You know, I mean, I have, I get emails all the time. Hey, thank you so much. And, and, you know, I always appreciate that gratitude and because it's important to me that uh, I put all this work into this app and that people are enjoying it. Well, I, I will tell you that I have, and I know Todd will, will agree to this, that we've both seen multiple times where people have said the app paid for itself today. Yeah. And and that's that's not uncommon for me to have heard through Facebook, through an instant message from a friend, those kind of things. And you know, I will say this, I'm proud of the collector's corner on Facebook that we may not have been like day one release down with the app. But man, we were on board per, from the first time we heard it and put in our due diligence to look and see what it is. Because the truth of the matter is, we all know that there are apps that go on the marketplace and they don't end up doing what they say that they do. And those are always sad, especially when they're comic book related, because you have such high hopes for them. And then Key Collector showed up and we were like, okay, this this is legit. This is not just, this is not somebody who's just printing off the, the annual price guide listings for all of these and not doing, not putting in any work. They're just copy and paste and a bunch of stuff like real time market values and those kind of things. But yeah, even, even then I know Todd, Todd has been a big fan since day one as well. Thanks, Todd. Yeah, no problem. Let, let me just let me just give you a story of how I use the app one time. So, we did this Christmas exchange, and it was like you know a five dollar Christmas exchange for the collector's corner. And I went to the comic book store, and I'm digging through boxes, and I'm trying to find something really cool for the guy that I'm exchanging with. And I I seen this Hulk book, and I'm looking at it, and I'm like, this is pretty cool. I wonder if this is anything special. So I pull up the key collectors app and I start looking through it and it turns out it's, it's the second pair appearance of rocket raccoon. So I found it. It was like, it was in the $5 box or something, but I'm a Hulk fan. So I was really excited about finding it. I don't know if the guy that I sent it to was as excited. I, I, I think he was, I hope. Hey, if he's a college fan, sure. Yeah. But your, your app was very helpful. And I actually, so I always struggled with, you know, I go and I, I'm digging through dollar bins and I'm trying to figure out what, what should I be looking for? And I'm very impatient. And so I decided because I like the flash, I like the flash TV show that I'm going to start going through Mar or uh, DC Wikia and I'm going to find every single reverse flash appearance. So I, I'm an accountant. So I had a spreadsheet up and I'm typing in every single reverse flash appearance. And it was either reverse flash or earbard thon. I think there's other reverse flashes as well. So I'm curious, is that kind of the same thing that you kind of do? Like, are, are you digging through like Marvel Wikia and DC Wikia? No, no, I don't do that because I, you really can't, honestly, man, I mean, you can't trust that information. You know, DC Wikia and, and Marvel, it's a fan site. I mean, it's it's not actually Marvel uploading their information. It's it's a fan site and it is, it's, it's subject to misinformation. So what I do is I go, I'll go on eBay and this is this it took me 3 years to build the database before I even launched it. And John to your point, you guys were pretty much on board right away. Like that first day that I actually posted to social media, Collectors Corner was one of the sites that I that I groups that I posted it and you guys were very kind, you picked up on it right away and so the app's only been around for about 16 months now. 
But what I do is I, I'll look, I, I kind of go backwards. So I'll go to eBay and I'll, I'll plug in a minimum price and then I'll look and I'll st- and see what sells that's raw for over you know, eight bucks. And then I will cross reference everything by going to read comic online, which is like a cool, I mean, it's a free base. It's a free comic book. They scan everything. It's like a pirated site. But which I don't recommend, of course, I recommend, you know, supporting the comic book industry. But I cross reference everything by actually looking to see if that is in there because there's so much. There's so much that is not correctly logged by anybody. They just, you know, one one error like on Marvel Wiki is could perpetuate to all these different resources or, you know, Overstreet. An example is Cicada. You know, the first appearance of Cicada, they, you know, that's, I forgot what Flash comic it is, but he doesn't actually fully show up until two issues after that comic says it's his first appearance. I think his, the, the gleam of his spectacles <laughs> are, the, are the appearance in that book. And we all know that that's not like, if you bought that book, you'd be like, what the hell? Lalandra is another example. Lalandra, the X Men, whatever the first appearance. It's not. I think is it one hundred and seven. I can't remember. But Lalandra from the Shi'ar, her first appearance. You can't even see her. She has a space helmet on in one panel, and you would never. And it, you would never know. She doesn't appear until like eight or nine issues later. But it. it but hey, if you go and you look at a CGC label, it says. It's her first appearance, and it most certainly is not her first appearance. That's kind of interesting. So, like, Venom right now has, in Venom number seven, they have the first appearance of Dylan Brock, who is, at the time, Eddie Brock's su- or brother, right? But it says he only appears in flashback. Then, in issue nine, I think he fully appears. And then in issue 11, we find out, in in I'm sorry for this spoiler, but (laughs) if you haven't read it by now, I'm sorry. But in issue 11, we find out that it's Eddie Brock's son. So, like, is issue 7 in flashback the one that you got to buy? Is issue 9 the full appearance the one you got to buy? That's always the struggle. I think everybody argues about, like, Hulk 180 and Hulk 181. But it seems to change over time, like, because, like, I, I was looking at um, Marvel Wikia and they were saying the first appearance of Dylan Brock and it said in flashback is Venom number seven. But if you if you look at like, you know, Hulk 180, you see Wolverine fully. Right. But 181 is the money book. Well, and I think that, you know, in, in that to me, uh, you know, a lot of people have that question. Well, yeah. OK, so Dylan Brock's first cameo appearance is. In Venom Seven, and if if now, what are we calling a cameo? Well, one thing that will never change, no matter what we try to do, is that Wolverine's first appearance will be one eighty. No, that'll never change. It will always be called a cameo. And why not use that as the definition of a cameo, right? I mean, one panel. His name is mentioned. I mean, it should be a first appearance because he, it's it's a full. First appearance of Wolverine, his name is said, he introduces himself. I mean, something like that should be considered a first appearance, but it doesn't have the cool cover that 181 has. So, you know, that's the big seller. But if that's the watermark, why not just use that as a watermark? If they're only in one panel, and he might actually be in more than one panel, I think. The thing that's starting to get wild, that's starting, that it, there's a problem. CGC is inconsistent with what they call, like, for example, John, you were talking about uh, Umbrella Academy earlier, that you had the free comic book day issue, which is uh, a flip book. It's free. It's uh, Umbrella Academy on one side. And on the other side, it's an, another comic book that I can't, it's that never took off, whatever it is. But the Umbrella Academy is a preview of the first issue. And they call, so CGC calls that the first appearance of all these different characters. Right, uh, the boy first appearance of the cra- of crack whatever. There was a a preview of preacher also 
in the same vein, a, a pre, an eight-page preview comic book, but Preacher number one, the full comic book, is considered the first appearance of Preacher. So I think the inconsistency from, from those that lead what is uh, determined this or that is part of the problem. So that and, and that's when sometimes I get people that'll reach out and say, hey, CGC says this or that. And I say, you know, that's good for CGC that they say that. But that I am looking to I'm blazing my own trail for Key Collector Comics where I'm looking at these issues and vetting them. I'm making sure that the information is correct. Is all the information correct? No, probably not. <laughs> but it will be at some point. Soon, because if somebody notices something is wrong, I'm approachable. Anybody could email me at any time, Nick at Key Collector Comics, and I make that change instantaneously. Or like John, John, huge Tick fan, right, John? One hundred percent, yes. Hey, right, huge. So, so I know what people are. So, John tells me, you know what? You don't have this tick in there. You don't have that tick, and I go, okay, you know what? I'm going to get that added. I'll add that because I know that. If John's a huge Tick fan and I am missing some Tick books that are essential to that character's lore, then John is doing me a favor by reaching out to me and saying, hey, this you got to get this in there. So with that being said, John, if there are any Tick books that as a uh, non-biased, I want you to tell me in a non-biased about Tick kind of way, just shoot me an email and let me know which ones those are. Oh, absolutely! I will now. Now, I will tell you that that the one, and just just because you brought this up, I w- I will let you know there is one out there that I did my own research on it, and it's the tick number two, its first print, but it does not have the die cut window. It is an extremely scarce book to the point that. Early on, it was rumored not to even exist, but the the basis of the story that I have gotten from from NEC Comics, who who produced the tick, is that it was a print error that the printer shipped, you know, sent the books along with the the die cut books, and it was kind of one of those they didn't throw them away. And so NEC, making lemonade out of lemons, decided, you know what? Extremely, extremely scarce book. We're going to sell them. Why, why would we not sell them? We've paid for them. We're going to sell them. And so what ended up happening is, and you can see it in later tick issues, they were selling the tick number two, no window, for more then they were selling the tick number one SE, that special edition that was 5,000 copies, all serial numbered. Because back in the day, serial numbering something was supposed to make it more important, more valuable, those kind of things. And if memory serves, last time I checked the CGC registry, there are less than 13 of them graded in any grade whatsoever. And the highest grade that I am aware of, again, it's it's been a month or two since I've checked, highest grade that I'm aware of is an 8.5. So they are super scarce. And my understanding is there's somewhere between 250 or 300. That's the that's the closest number I can get on that to to kind of pass. Well, I made a note of it. Yeah, yeah. To pass that along to you. And e- eBay prices reflect that whenever people are not just letting go of them willy nilly. And and full disclosure, I got one of them. And when I got it, we're all familiar with the the Facebook Live auctions where guys are videoing what they're selling and whatever. And this guy's feed, God bless him, he was having a terrible time with his feed. But I was trying to stick with it because, hey, you know what? I'm really actually the only guy who is sticking with it. If he cleans up his feed, I might get some deals. I might see some stuff. And he's thumbing through the the long boxes, you know, because his feed's being junky. And he 
thumb through and hit a section of about six tick books. And I mean, it was cutting in and out, but I said, Hey, instant message me on those tick books. Well, I need to know if I need any of them. Send me actual photos whenever your live feed is done. And he did. I picked it up for $3. I picked them all up for $3 a piece plus shipping, which was amazing because like you say, that take no window. I didn't even know what it was at first. I thought it was a, like they did a color printing of them, all of those fun things. But it turns out that's, that's like a 50 to a hundred dollar comic book raw. And if you get into graded, they go up from there. So, and by the way, that was pre key collector app even existing And I said all that to say this, that there were only two places that I got any information on it at all, on the web at all. There was a recalled comic book site that had something. That's a great site. But it it only had just a few paragraphs and not a great big description or anything like that. Then I did my own self. I did a write-up for Outright Geekery whenever I was reviewing comic books for them. And I plan on doing that again in the future. If they'll have me back. Yeah. I like those guys. I like that. They, I like that they focus on books that, you know, a lot of the other sites aren't right. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. There, there are a lot more in now they'll review and they're, they're great guys. They have their own podcasting area and they've they're top notch. So that's one other place. If people are looking for research, they, they will see that there. But the only other place that I found it was a CGC Reddit thread where somebody said something about it too. And then after that, I like I say, I had to go to NEC directly to ask and then actually physically open up my original 12 books to see where they were selling it to see that was legit. So anyway... That that's a bit of my rambling story. You you brought up the tick and pulled that out of me. But yeah, just just like that though, I know that there have been several times whenever through Facebook or through your YouTube channel, that kind of thing, that you you have actually solicited, just like you did here with giving your email. Hey guys, if we're missing something on there. Help us out. Let it help us figure out where we're missing stuff. Yeah, no one, no one can know everything, and you know every every. But there is an expert for for everything. So no, no one can know everything. But there's there's a person that has more information about a certain category or character or series that that person is an unofficial expert for the most part. So. I try to uh, uh, really nurture that sort of environment with the app or the website that people can uh, reach out to me and let me know, hey, what the hell am I missing? What 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 would people find? Because you know what it's like. You know when you would you're thumbing through a magazine or you're looking on a website and you see that little tidbit of inf- interesting information about whatever subject it might be. And you're like, oh wow, look at what wow, that's interesting. I didn't know that. It could be the most, you know, minute thing, but since something gave it life, a different layer to that information that made it interesting, that's what I try to do with the app is is deliver this comprehensive but concise, but concise information so that people can find things that they are normally not um aware of like one example is i it's called i think it's called manifest destiny 2099 or something like that uh it's a comic book and it's the first appearance of moon knight 2099 which when i found that i didn't even know that that existed i didn't know there was a moon knight 2099 but it, there is and it's a female it's a female moon knight so in the comic book, couldn't be more obscure. I really think it's called Manifest Destiny 2099. Actually, going to look it up on Key Collector right now. It's funny you say that because I was just doing that. I already did. It's done. It is. It's Manifest Destiny 2099. 
So uh, the first appearance of Star Force, well, actually, in Captain Marvel, Star Force is going to go, going to appear, and their first appearance is Avengers three forty six. So I picked up a couple copies of those just for the heck of it, you know, just because you never know, right? And I also I picked up the first appearance of Arkham Knight because in Detective Comics one thousand. Arkham Knight is going to be the main villain. And I'm thinking maybe potentially they might be trying to, you know, push this storyline or put Ar Arkham Knight into the story a little bit more. Are there any other sleepers that you see that are out there that people might be able to pick up for, you know, five, ten dollars on eBay? I mean, you as you sound somewhat like an expert. I mean, what do you think? Yeah, I think there's a lot. I mean, we're living in like the golden age of, uh, you know, being a comic fan. Uh, I should probably think of a different term than golden age, but it's a damn good time to be a comic book fan because there's so, so much coming out. I mean, you know, a lot of it is speculation, which I find on the spec deck. You know, there's one character that I, you know, actually I did a, a video on Key Collector Comics YouTube about speculation. And a lot of it so far is looking in that direction, uh, like Kid Loki, uh, his first appearance, Viv Vision, I felt that they might go down the direction with the Scarlet Witch vision story of them building a family and almost, you know, uh, literally building a family. I, and, and it did come out that they are going to take some source material from Tom King's run on, on Vision, which introduces his family. Viv Vision, of course, is, you know, pretty popular in the Young Avengers, not Young Avengers, uh, the Champions, as she's in that book right now. But then they started talking about, you know, her kids. Scarlet Witch's kids are Wiccan and Hulking from Young Avengers 1. But when she, so in the 80s, Scarlet Witch had twins. She had twin boys. She basically made them manifest through her magic. And then they were kidnapped by Master Pandemonium, who makes his first appearance in West Coast Avengers number four. And I think that we might see, because I guess what they're doing with the, that Disney Plus series is they're going to go down more of like a horror line, like almost make it somewhat of a horror story instead of just the, you know, the regular superhero action blazing. So Agatha Harkness will be in it. And I'm thinking this character that might resemble Master Master Pandemonium because there's this freaky ass cover. I forgot what issue it is in West Coast Avengers, but her children are his arms. It's like the creepiest cover. He's got two babies for arms and it's Scarlet Witch's children. But if they do go down that line with horror, I think that might be one of them. There's also uh, Spider-Man, Spider-Men number two, issue number one, the 616 version of Miles Morales is like a criminal and seeing that miles morales doesn't really have a a villain you know they're gonna have to he needs a villain i think that what might be holding some of his books back is that they haven't really built like a good rogues gallery for him and i think that would be a good having he his 616 villain version of him which i think he traded places with that that character might have gone to the ultimate universe even though it doesn't exist anymore but of course they could bring him back but he's like a He's a bad dude. Uh, that one, I think that, you know, a good bet is some of, some more of Donnie Cates' stuff, like uh, Interceptor, which they, which I believe they, no, they didn't announce as a, as a movie or a series, but Vault, the comic book company Vault, just picked up that, picked up the licensing on it again. And, you know, there's so many of these comic book publishers. There's no, there's not a whole lot of money to be made in publishing, right? I mean, you have to pay a writer, you have to pay a, an artist, you have to pay for the office that your publishing company works out of. There is printing costs, there is marketing costs. So it's very difficult for people to make money on comics. But when they sell it, option it, when they license that property, that's when the money starts to come in on that. So what you see is a company like Dark Horse. Dark Horse just, they sold off a portion of their ownership to a media company 
And you can see it reflected in a lot of Dark Horse books uh, series that are coming out that's, that are new. The, the solicitation for them reads like a movie. So it's think about how much easier it is for a company, a production company to adapt a comic book over a movie. You already have the storyboard right there. You have the dialogue right there. You have the costume design right there. I mean, everything is is already there in this package for you. You can almost take a comic book and the next day start shooting the movie. I mean, provided you have all the sets or whatever. But you have the dialogue. You have the char- you have the you know the look of the character. You have the, the storyline all storyboarded. So that's why all these different uh, streaming services that are coming out are really getting into. Uh, comic books and, and buying up these properties and having all these these price wars. So, you know, when you hear about Grant Morrison being secured by a production company, uh, you know, you could look at his independent works as having a pretty good chance of going up in value because it, it, it could be made. Uh, Greg Rucka, a lot of the big artists that also have independent books, um, Kelly Sue DeConnick, there's um, who wrote Sex Criminals? Sex Criminals is one. Uh, what's the other one? Bitch Planet is another. There, there are a lot of these independents that it just makes sense. I mean, you could almost read the title and you're like, oh, yeah, I can see that, you know, being a, a movie. So there, there is a lot. Actually, a lot of it is on the spec deck. If, if you're interested, you can scroll through the spec deck. I've, I've had a pretty pretty high uh, ratio of success so far with this stuff. And I do get some insider information. You know, one of the things, so I was telling you before, I, I've never been in tech. I've never, you know, been in the comic industry, but I have been in sales and, and I used to do liquor sales. I used to work for a company. I, I managed the state of Illinois and Wisconsin and I uh, was uh, the sales manager for the, for the, for the state. So, I know how important it is to get in front of people. I know how important it is to talk to people. So I spend a lot of time reaching out to strangers that are in the industry and saying, hey, this is what I have. This is who I am. Uh, you know, here's, here's an idea I have. Here's some, but I nurture these relationships in an, in an effort to see where Key Collector Comics can be more helpful to the industry and also to see what kind of relationships I can build so that I can communicate this information to the people that are keeping the app alive, which are the subscribers and the people that are using the eBay affiliate links, because that that's how the app, that's how I fund it at this point. And that's why I, John, you mentioned earlier, some other apps that might've come and gone because of, for whatever reason, but big thing for me, is to remove any conflicts of interest that would pollute the information that I provide. So I don't sell comics. That's a big thing because I don't have any sort of reason to say, hey, this book I'm speculating on, or this book is hot, or the only thing that I have or the app has is its name, is its integrity. And if that is whole and the app is trusted, that's when the app is app and website are successful. So that, so everything is researched in an effort to give people the best information. I feel like I just went off on a tangent. I don't know. No, man, that that's great actually, because like you're saying your integrity and the name of the app are paramount. And I've, I've had this discussion with my kids before about certain things where there there are companies out there that while they may not have done things that were illegal, they did things that were not above board and not ethical, and that ended up costing them portions of market share in some cases. In other cases, it caused the the entirety of the company to go out of existence. You know, so those kind of things absolutely happen and it's, it really is important. And especially in the information game, which 
which is really, really what, what we're dealing in is, is information. If your information can't be trusted, then you essentially are, are, are making yourself obsolete at that point. Not that I foresee that for key collector at all. Cause like you say, I've, everything that I've witnessed since the very beginning. And I went back to see if I could figure out when I downloaded the app originally. And I, Oh, I could probably tell you if you give me your email address that you're registered under. Oh, I, yeah, I, I could do that. I, I'm not going to give it during the podcast. Cause I'll, I'll end up somebody, somebody will end up emailing me a, a digital copy of, of your dick. Uh, yeah. Something, <laughs> something that I don't need to be opening up in my, in my email. But uh, anyway, you know, it's, it's one of those things where it definitely pays to be above board on not selling books or not hyping books just so you can pump them and then dump them, which is what yeah, I get blamed a lot for that. And it's like, I, you know, people, oh, you, you're just talking this book up. And it's like, dude, I don't have any reason to do that. If, I, if, this, if this app is anything but 100% with the best intentions for the people that are using it, not for myself, if it's anything but that, it's a failure. And, and there's no one book or there's no one company that can offer me one thing, even if it's a big sum of money to put that into jeopardy because I'm not looking at this as being around for a year and then I'm going to try and make some big score. No, I want it to be part of the zeitgeist of comic books. Right. You know, this is an, and, and you know, this is this, like you said earlier, you know, what is in the future? Well, I want the collection to be a, a, a very, a robust resource with a lot of different aspects to it that can get people involved and get people up to just right, you know, get people involved and, and, and quickly assimilated to whatever it is that they're interested in in comic books and, and give them a, a one-stop shop to, you know, for whatever. So without going into too much detail on that, there's, a, there's probably 10 years of architecture on key collector that will keep it keep it relevant and keep me busy and keep collectors happy <laughs> that's that's it right on man well and and you said being part of the zeitgeist of of the comic book community if you're not there already it's it's not for lack of trying and i i don't see it not being that for very long because Dealing in the type of information that you're dealing in is it's it's a big deal. People need to know what their collections are worth, if for no other reason than to insure those comic books and, and to make sure that if something unforeseen happened, they they would not have their value back. You know, no nobody wants to to just throw money away. You know, we're, we're all looking, we're all looking at least to have the, the money invested in our enjoyment. But in, in a lot of cases, we also definitely want that money invested and to see it grow over time, whether we realize that growth in our lifetime or we pass it on to somebody else. Yeah. I think that, no, I mean, I, I think that comic books are, it's a funny thing I think that it's a it's a good way to merge your childhood enjoyment of so, something that you loved with something that's responsible because you know if it, again if you're married and your wife's like well, what are you doing buying all this stuff you could say look I'm investing I am investing what are you talking about what am I doing I'm doing what's best for us so there is there is an adult aspect of comic book collecting which is you know making sure that you're you're spending money on something that you love and something that is in connection with your with what you loved growing up but it's also has a value to it it's not just it's not just it's not nothing but to your, what you were saying earlier about you know what we were saying you know becoming a a a cornerstone of the comic book collecting industry i'll tell you what i i so i just moved back to chicago 
Today I was doing some errands and I stopped in two comic book stores here in the city of Chicago. I went in and with some flyers, I introduced myself. Neither store owner had ever heard of Key Collector Comics. There's a lot of people, you know, I see people send me messages. Oh, you know, the app's great, but everybody's using it. Well, maybe everybody that is vocal about it is using it, but it hasn't even, it, ha, it, it is very unknown in the larger scale of collecting or, or comic collectors. I, I, would, I would assume, I can only approximate, I would say maybe 15% of store owners know about it and probably even less of the full population of comic collectors actually know about key collectors. So let me just jump in here. So we've hit the hour mark and this is usually when we wrap up. First off, I want to say I, I hate you guys right now because Nick, you have been such an entertaining guest. I could go, uh, I, I could listen to you talk forever and ever. And our fan oh, thank you. And, and, and our fans are probably going to be disappointed because I didn't talk that much in this one. So, you know, screw you guys. But anyways, yeah, well, jump in. <laughs> but by the way, I hope you edit a lot of this because, it, you know, there's a lot of stuff that I said that could probably be chopped down from a minute to like. Oh, no, no, no. You did a fantastic job. Both of you guys did. So first of all, there's two things. The first thing is, all right, how do people get this app? And then you you mentioned a web page. Do you also have a web page? The other thing, and this one's for John. You may want to ask him about Jar Jar before we Darth Jar Jar before we leave this podcast. So Nick, Nick, why don't you go ahead and uh, you know tell us tell people how we get your app and tell them you know if there's a website and then John do your thing. Yeah, the app is free on uh, Apple or Google Play. It's got a four point eight out of five star rating, so you know you know you're getting something good. Uh, it's it's free on. Or you could go to the website, keycollectorcomics.com. All of the information from the site is now also on, or from the app is now on the website as well. Uh, and you could download the app from there. So there's a couple places. It's not difficult to find. Made it very easy to find. That That is something else I appreciate about you and the app is if people don't aren't finding it, it's... It's not for your lack of putting it out there and and helping them try to find it. So, yeah, as has become our custom around here, I get to go into and and ask. This is not something we prepped beforehand. So, so if you're unfamiliar, let me see if we can familiarize. Are you familiar with the the theory? that was put out by by um star wars fans over the last couple of years that jar jar binks is actually was intended to be the number one baddie the the darth uh i'm sorry not darth the sith lord in the prequel trilogy were you aware of that which one which lord who well see that's that's the question. What was he? And by the way, too, I think it was really funny that people were saying that somehow Snoke was going to be Jar Jar Binks before before the Force Awakens and that type of thing. No, man, I I don't know anything about that. But what I do know, well, and I hate to keep going. I mean, I I sound like an asshole to keep bringing it back to. No, you're cool. The Darths of Star Wars category up right now. Where you could where you could look at where all the Darth uh, characters made their first appearance in comics. So there's like 25 of them up there, but go ahead. It was oh, Darth Jar Jar is going to be the main guy. I don't think so. Well, I, I promise you there is a, U, there's a YouTube video out there that if you invest eight minutes of your life in, it'll convince it will, cha- you. It, it, it will change your perspective. I'll check it out. It, it, it just, just type in YouTube, Darth Jar Jar. It'll blow your mind, man. I promise. It, 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 he, you'll, you'll go from because everybody that I've brought this up to initially that has not heard, they're like, 
Jar Jar sucks. I hate Jar Jar. Why would who cares about Jar Jar? No, man, it's it, it. You can definitely see it in the movie clips, but you can also see it outside of the movie clips. And uh, I I won't ruin it. I get if I get the feeling that if Todd and I have our way, you will be back on on the podcast at a future date with us. If it, you know schedule allowing that kind of thing, of course. Awesome man, awesome. Real quick, Todd. I know that we're we're going a little over uh, on this week's uh, podcast. Before we get going too far. I want to remind everybody about BransonComicCon.com. Branson Comic Con is coming up in two weeks. Two weeks. I am going, and we're we're going to be. Uh, they've in, extended the invitation to me to attend and to uh, interview some folks. Uh, Karen Nicole, AZ Power Girl, is going to be my guest for sure. I am also working on a few other guests as well. But if you would like to check her out via social media, type in AZ Power Girl, and she is all over Instagram, Facebook. She has she has a YouTube channel, those kind of things. But if you're interested in attending the con, it is BransonComicCon.com. That they uh, there are other guests there that, like I say, I'm trying to line up, and hopefully we'll have some positive news in that front over the the uh, next week or so yeah so uh I, I we we're over the hour mark and i'm sorry to cut this short but i have to edit all this stuff and i can i can only handle so much of the ums and the breaths and all of that stuff i'm just joking here but <laughs> nick you are awesome bro thank you so much thank you man this is the first time i talked to you and i already feel like you're my, one of my brothers we're bros Thank you for joining us. Anybody out there, check out the Key Collectors app. Support Nick and what he's doing. He's doing it for the most best reason possible, to help us all out so that when we go to the comic book store, we know what we're doing and we're not just blind and stupid. So, Nick, thank you for thank you for what you're doing. I really appreciate it. I'm sure John, I know John appreciates it. 